All right, welcome everybody to episode 13 of the Pod EC. This one might be a little bit shorter because we are currently sheltering refugee Dorky from his MDI wardens that are chasing him down, trying to get him to go back to practice. And I think next week as well, you're probably going to be busy doing that around podcast oh, yeah, time as well. So we may uh, source a guest or something, or I don't know. We'll figure out what we want to do next week. But either way, uh, we have some cool stuff to talk about this week. There was a big post about mythic rating that came out that we may uh use or discuss some of the points from it um there was also some hero talents discussion and or you know changes that came out and uh blizzard they put out this tweet that said like hardcore self-bound hero talents and more and then they linked like this week in wow but then actually in that post there's nothing about hero talents there's just like a there's a thing that says there's going to be a dev announcement so i guess now we know that's going to be uh is some more hero well, talents probably I thought I thought I I read exactly the phrase there are eight hero talents being released tomorrow. Oh, then perhaps I read that post and my eyeballs went over that part. Yeah. So control so F hero. Oh yeah. So we'll be right. talking about this or at least referencing it in the next episode, which should be like six days after they're released. Ooh. But yeah, tomorrow, February twenty seventh, we are getting an early look at eight new hero talent trees. Massive amount of information. Uh, so tomorrow will be very interesting. Yeah, so I I imagine that uh, YouTube channels and stuff will be the place to go and find, you know, content about those rather than... Oh, yeah. I guess, I mean, by the time next podcast, we can still talk about oh, them. Both, but... I'm sure both you and I will have a video for probably every I'm single one. I'm, like, gone this week, so I'm mine will be late as well if I... Wait, you're oh. gone too? Yeah, man. Hey, where I'm, are you going? I'm gone. I'm hanging out with some friends for a couple days, so... Oh, cool. Despawning. Okay. Well, yeah, off of the internet. Yeah, off the internet for a bit. That is really weird. Yeah, I, I actually want to ask you guys about that. Can you do that? Can I have found as a streamer, it's really hard to take longer trips. Like anytime I'm gone for more than five days, I have this feeling like I have to be streaming, and it's not like a metrics and you have to be consistent and like money and Twitch Prime. It's none of that. It's like I just get bored and I want to be doing it, and I can't do it I know well exactly what you somewhere mean. else well, yeah but also at the same time it feels like you know if you're a content creator and you're gone it's like five days feels like a month and it's because like a lot of times there are a lot of people who frequently watch you especially if you're a daily streamer and people will just be wondering where the hell did the streamer go because you know we're used to having that part of their life yeah yeah like if you guys listen to any podcast or anything right like i like there's, for example, I have a podcast I listen to that comes out on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, and they're on vacation this week, and I missed that announcement, and I am like, my life sucks when I don't have that to either listen to on a car ride or as I'm sleeping. So like, for so many people, your stream is that to them. So like, you know, you'll have VOD watchers and everything, and like, if you're not there, they feel bad. Yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of incentive if you're a streamer as well, like, you know, the first 40 hours you stream in a given month are going to make you probably less money than the next 40 hours you could add on top of that, right? Like, there's sort of an incentive to just do as much as you can. And if you take a couple of days off, like each day you take off is increasingly bad for a bit. Um, so definitely something that you're aware of, although I've already kind of just not been streaming for a little while, partially because I stupid tooth thing was uh, was annoying and then I was recovering from that and then... I also do, you know, I, I'm less only stream oriented. Like I do casting on the Warcraft channel. I do this podcast, mm -hmm. another podcast, um, video stuff. So I don't know. Sometimes I'll just go like everything. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll go like a month or two without streaming and just do the other stuff and then come back and, you know, stream again. Uh, and that you definitely like, I definitely get people that are like, you know, miss you, right? Like, or where's the stream? Those kind of things. So I do feel what bad. Is what is the longest you guys have actually i think drat knows you took like a big break oh yeah streaming at one point. i mean i haven't i have, dude, I haven't streamed in like a month or something now as well it's been okay yeah which that well door i think i've gone maybe two before since I, like since i became a partner twitch streamer so why like that. is that why do you do that well i often like there's a content blitz time for me which is new expansion new patch any of that kind of stuff where I'm like waking up and then doing wow stuff, especially during the race to world first. But even after the race to world first, it's still like all that I'm doing is content creation stuff or like 
like 24 7 so and so break. then i instead of maintaining that pace or cutting back to a normal amount i'll kind of compensate by just like taking a month and playing path of exile all day without streaming or something like that because mm. uh you know i enjoy that and enjoy I, there are some games where i enjoy playing them and i i wouldn't really enjoy streaming them as much because the way that i stream is pretty like energy intensive for me whereas just playing video games by myself isn't and it it's hard for me to just turn on stream and play video games low energy like not informative or explaining oh, stuff yeah or I know talking. Exactly what you mean. but that, that's where a lot of streamers have a second channel too. yeah i i understand the appeal of that yeah yeah, yeah i might do like, that. you know you want to you want to put on your stream and like when you're streaming you want to have like your stream energy you want to be able to talk a lot and make it interesting but like sometimes you just want to play the game right sometimes you just want to like sit there lay down and just fucking hit buttons and not really have to worry about anything but obviously that's like you know not what you want your stream to be about i actually fully get that and i also have that a lot of times the longest i've not streamed for is like maybe only really a month like not a whole lot it's usually just mdi stuff like usually yeah, it'll be either mdi crazy. or tgp where i take a break i cannot well, imagine that, doing that i can't imagine it like i i, I just doing what i taking that much time off i mean I, i've been streaming i think full time for like four years now um and that has been i mean i don't think i've taken more than nine days off in that amount of time and maybe it's just that compulsive like i just i i, like, I get bored and i just want to do it uh but it's it's not like you're afraid like i've taken the nine days and i think as a streamer it's always like man my audience will never be there when i come back i think that's the biggest fear um but it's not that because i've done it before and then the audience is there and then you're like whoo okay that's fake news then all right cool uh but i just i don't know i can't i would just get bored like i don't know what else you would do <laughs> like i'm just weird i guess well i think one thing that's true for you about streaming that isn't as true for me is that streaming for you is like you're pretty much being the same guy you would be if your stream was turned off Correct. for the most part like it's obviously you know you're doing a little you're you're doing work for sure but like you're it drains I, your social battery you could say yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well because for me like i don't think i wouldn't say i have the, like that different of a personality when i stream because there are definitely people that do right i do a little bit but not to the extent of, of some streamers that like really just change entirely when the camera's on or off. But I do when I'm streaming, like I'm answering questions a lot and like talking about, you know, basically pe people come to me and they ask questions about what I think about stuff or uh, advice, those kind of things. And answering those questions and giving that advice is something that I think I'm good at, but not something that I can do without expending like energy. Uh, it's something that, you know, does, does drain me a little bit. So it's nice sometimes to, just play a game without that element going on. Man, I've never really thought about it like that. Yeah, I guess especially you, because I think a lot of people look to you for news and stuff like that, where you feel like you have to be on 100% of the time. Like, I feel like I'm like that when I'm streaming, because like if I don't feel very creative, then I feel like my content will be bad. But I do actually feel like I just kind of turn on my stream and just exist. And that works. And that's something that you can do a lot. Is that is that kind of the same for you, Dorky? Or do you feel like like, for example, you do a lot of keys on stream. Would you do those keys off stream? Like, is that what you would just do normally? You're just there streaming? Or do you feel like it's a lot of extra effort? Uh, I would say both. Like, it definitely works both ways. Like, there are definitely a lot of times where I just, like, do keys. And I'm kind of just like, oh, I probably should be streaming this. But it's kind of whatever. I just don't really feel like turning on at the moment. But it's also, like, really weird for me. I find myself having to do long streams like if i just turn my stream on for like an hour or two i feel like man do i really want to be bothering turning my stream on because like i've noticed that you max you do turn on your stream a lot right like where you just turn on your stream and just do like an hour or two just like a short little like talk about stuff that's yeah. going on mm -hmm. but i find it really hard for me to do that i can't put myself to do short streams like for me it's either i'm doing an eight hour plus stream or i might as well just not stream and I don't oh, know wow, why that's exactly so it is. different. That's, yeah. that's the opposite of me. I, I like, I literally turn on my stream, have a ton of fun. And the second I get bored, I turn it off. That that's, that's what I do. It, it's, it, but you're, you look at, you approach it so differently. Yeah. yeah Cause like, I, I, I like to have my stream on for a while and people can like, you know, tune in and out and all that stuff. And 
I don't know. I feel like if I just like do a short stream, it's like, oh man. Well, what do you do when really... you get bored? Do you never get bored? I mean, it depends. Like, obviously, I'll like stop in the middle of the stream sometimes and just like take a break and just like do over shit or grab some food or whatever. But for the most part, like, that's where I try to keep it entertaining for longer durations. And sometimes it's just not possible. Like, if there's just like nothing, like right now, for example, right? Well, aside from them, the app practice, there's really not a whole lot going on. I'm not really trying to play WoW, nor am I really trying to, like, play any other game. So this would be, like, a moment where I wouldn't really be streaming and rather just be, like, either watching YouTube or maybe, like, fucking reading a book or some shit, watching a movie. Okay. Well, yeah, so sorry for... Uh, thanks for entertaining me. I, I just find stuff like that really interesting. I, I just wanted to hear your all's uh, perspective about it. I think stuff like that's cool. Also, I think a lot of people who listen to this follow us as streamers, so it might be interesting to hear like kind of the nuts and bolts behind that. Genuinely, I think we could do this as the whole topic for this or a, a future podcast if we wanted to. That's one of the joys of being in charge of our own podcast, especially it might grief Frank as well if he's already been prepping thumbnails or titles or stuff, if we just change the topic midway through. <laughs> yeah. So that could be good, but I mean, we can do whatever we want. Um I mean, that's kind of like why we made this podcast in the first place is we would just be talking on stream and talk about literally anything and people loved it, right? So like, for example, uh, for people who are listening to this, we when we started this podcast today, not one time do we mention talking about this. It just happened off of one person saying something and then asking a question and then getting there, right? So uh, that's what makes the, the podcast cool. I do think I, I would like to get into a few of the other things, though. I think I think it might be a topic for another time. Okay. Yeah, um, we can get into it. Yeah, and he, uh, let us know, you know, if you want if you want to hear more about that. But uh, I guess we did have MDI happen this last weekend, which last week's episode, if you're interested in some real deep discussion about MDI stuff, we talked about that a lot last week. This time we'll probably only do it for a few minutes, not not the whole thing. So if you're not interested, you don't care at all about MDI, just hit that you know forward thirty seconds button a few times, and uh, it'll be over. But uh, yeah, Dorky, as uh, I guess watching this, preparing to face off against these teams in the global finals. How did that how that weekend look to you? Yeah, so I didn't watch last weekend, obviously, because I was playing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this week's games compared to last week's. Felt like, you know, maybe the quality of the games weren't as exciting this week or this weekend, but maybe that's just because I didn't get to watch last weekend. I was hoping to see a little bit more, but it's kind of like what we talked about last week. There's probably not going to be as much innovation this week. There's probably not going to be anything exciting we'll see. I mean, we did see a couple of exciting things, right? Like, we did see some pretty cool stuff from Mandatories Everbloom, where they went left, and they were, like, bringing down the three casters, and they were doing, like, a super fast run. But there really weren't too many interesting things we've seen this week. I don't know. How did you guys feel? Well, as a consumer i'm not casting it i'm not a person competing in it just someone who watches i i thought this weekend was really cool i felt like i mean especially in echo cups there's like always a little bit of uh non-interest because a lot of people who watch this casually are just like well i mean echo's just gonna win and then like that's what happened and there's not as much competition near the top uh, especially on sunday um but like going into this weekend i don't think anyone really knew you know, Mandatory had played unbelievably well in the past. Perplex is, like, super good, has a new player. Um, and the other two teams, names are escaping me right now, but they were huge Bald bangers. Bandits. Yeah, Bald Bandits, which has a couple players from our guild in it, and Eclipse, which has the, like, AJ uh, team from, that was last minute in the last TGP, which, like, was really good in their cup, at least. The, their global finals, not as much. Uh, but it seemed like the top four teams, I would say that whenever they were playing each other in this cup, it was probably 60, 40 in either direction. And it was never really any higher than that. Um, until maybe the grand finals where perplexed kind of just looked better. Um, but also there's this weird thing that we encountered last week where clearly like teams wanted to make it to the grand finals, but only really echo in their cup and perplexed in this cup, like practice to win the grand finals. There's not a lot of money in the cups. It's mainly about seeding. One and two doesn't really matter that much. But to me, that kind of shows perplexed and echo as like the teams I would definitely put my money on in the grand finals. They both looked really if you ignore all past biases, because there is a, you know, echo has historically won everything. So, you know, you are 
often just like they're just going to win, and maybe that happens. Uh, but if you ignore all of the past and you just look at what we have seen from the Cubs, I would say Echo and Perplex both look look really good. Maybe Perplex a little bit lower because we saw Echo do it without an extra week of information in practice, um, which is kind of important. Uh, but yeah, Global Finals Global Finals look fun. It was a super fun weekend. Uh, kind of sad that there's no uh, last chance qualifier this weekend. Uh, that's the thing that's missing from this uh, go around. But yeah, overall, big uh, big fan. I thought I thought this weekend was actually more fun to watch than the first one for me. I I don't think the I think I preferred the first weekend. There was definitely still some cool stuff shown here. Um, there was the summon, the s- set up a summon, kill the boss within two minutes, and take it tech, which I thought was just so uh, so cool. Um, so there was some there was some neat stuff this weekend, and there were a lot of close games as well. Like there were several games that went down to, okay, we're gonna check the logs and figure out the number of milliseconds exactly. Which, uh, whenever that's happening, those games were exciting. But I also felt like there were quite a few games this weekend as compared to last weekend, where a team wiped in the first three minutes, and then you knew they were gonna lose that map. And that yeah. anytime that happens in MDI, it's always like, oh, okay, you know, uh, especially if the caster's like, okay, I gotta. I got well, a hard yeah, job so for the we next 10 actually, minutes here. We were talking about that because we, we were yeah, yeah, we talked exactly yeah, about dude, that. Yeah, <laughs> dude, we were talking about that. We were we were co-streaming, so like obviously your job is much harder. When that happens, we just talked and I'm not kidding, James had a long monologue about water giraffes. Like the, the, we were going through it. Like we were just going to do some other stuff and then I would leave the stream unmuted and I would just hear you and Zyro just doing the lord's work being yeah. like and then this is happening and it's like, you know, you're doing your job, but at the same time, you know, like all of us know that shit is over. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, that was bad. To, and, and I would say the one thing that I would say the overall competition felt better in the two weeks, but there's one thing that didn't really get solved this time around, which was the Saturday, which was unbelievably unwatchable in the season one cups. It was just not very interesting this time. They made it so, like you said last week, some team is getting eliminated or disqualified all day uh, Saturday. But still, those first the first matches that are played in the lower bracket, mm-hmm. not the one where the second upper round gets knocked down, and they play like those those matches in season one and in this season felt completely irrelevant. Like whoever was going to get through those matches had no chance in the world to beat the team they would fight. And the next thing, it was just like the top four in each group were just significantly better than the back four in each group. And I don't, I don't know how you could solve that. We, we had a whole conversation on the co-stream about like head to head versus like, you know, the the TGP last chance style thing. And maybe head to head just kind of has that issue, right? There's just not that many good teams unless you just want to rip a grand final. There's there's eight good teams, right? But that's only good enough for one weekend to be awesome, right? So yeah. I don't know the solution. It's probably a whole other entire podcast topic, which we're not going to do, uh, but I, I, I it, that part of it at least still seen, and I definitely respect you guys keeping it interesting. It's so it's so funny to listen to from our our side. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's tough as well. I agree. Those are the definitely the weakest points in Saturday because Saturday is four banger series, and then there are the two series of like that are just the losers from the first day. And I mean, maybe there's creative ways you could fix that, but like you could just eliminate the two lowest lowest seated losers on friday and give the first two seeds a buy you and then give the give, yeah higher seeded ones yeah. a buy into the next series that that's something yeah. you could do but uh, i don't know if people would like that i mean uh, it, it's it's just a number of teams thing in the yeah. grand finals that would be bad yeah uh, but it means be horrible. because there are exactly four teams that are not really going to compete to qualify then it's just bad but yeah okay i have a little tangent here about mdi that uh i've kind of been thinking so we have these spots where you like look at the bracket and you're like, oh, we're only playing in these series. Like we actually only have seven different maps in our map pool and we can always oh, ban yeah, one yeah. of these, right? It's so, like, why don't we only practice these six, right? And then we can Oh yeah. We can just do those. Me. And there's another thing where it's just like, okay, we just have to make it to Sunday, right? So why why don't we just focus on those series and then we just yeah, get to Sunday? That's exactly why the grand finals in both of these weekends has been unwatchable. It's because one team just did that and the other team didn't. Right. And well, but it's a great point about Perplex though and Echo is that 
it is rational. It's logical to do that, right? Like it's even for Echo, it would be logical to focus only on the maps that get you to Sunday, right? Like because the prize pool is so heavily in the global finals versus in the in any weekend, right? Like it would be rational for them to do that to some extent, right? Um, but those very best teams are just always ready in all eight dungeons, right? And they're always playing to win, even in those games that aren't that are just for seeding or whatever, or for like you know a small amount of money on the cup weekends, right? So it's it's a pretty cool thing, like. You can kind of tell which teams are like really, really, really going for it as the ones that are kind of making that irrational decision to just be, you know, not have a weak dungeon and just plan to ban it out, right? Like they're just ready everywhere. And, and, uh, you know, that's, I don't know. I don't know, Dorky. I, I, have you guys like had discussions about that? Is this, is this a fair characterization of what Absolutely. I'm saying? Or am I like 100%? Because, for cups, it's really just about qualifying. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people just don't understand this. James was one of them during the co-stream. He was like, "Why don't you guys just like play to win? Like, how how are you guys only going for qualifying?" And like, what, what he doesn't understand is there's only so much time given to us for these maps that we have to practice for, and some of these maps are just not worth practicing because the time that could be spent is so much better spent on the dungeons that you want to master for getting into global finals and then once you get into global finals obviously you can try to go for the win then and i feel like it just goes to show it says something whenever teams are literally banning from the tides and bolstering and amazon's rise when they're just banning these maps constantly and these affixes it goes to show a lot it just shows that like there's no shot players want to be playing this stuff whether it's mdi or live keys I think what would help a lot of viewers would be if you one time went through the process of being an MDI team, getting your maps announced and which matches they're played in, and then go through and like go through the different scenarios of how you make it through the tournament. And you look at how many times you play these and it's like, oh, well, every time we only have rise in one of our map pools ever, which ha this happens all the time. Um, and the only time it's there our other one we can permanently ban is there so we can like just knock two dungeons out we'll never do it right unless it's like the last map of the grand finals and then maybe you could just not make it to the last game right and be better at those other dungeons also another misconception is that it's like you're wasting your time by not preparing all of them you can really only logically prepare those maps when you feel like the ones that you're bringing to competition are actually great I think a lot of times something that Echo and Perplex or whoever does is they're just better at practicing and getting these dungeons ready to go faster so mm -hmm. they are able to do those other maps. For example, if you know you play, like you could maybe even have pull this on the screen, the thing that Frank put in the production, if you know you're playing Black or Cold in every series, but your Black or Cold isn't great, why on earth would you be spending an equal amount of time working on Throne of the Tides, right? It just doesn't make sense. Um, but what the thing is, is like Echo, I'm just gonna make up a number. They're gonna get a workable, good black rock hold done in twice the time that the fourth seed is gonna do. And therefore they can just have more time being more consistent at your ever blooms and your way crests and your thrones. So it's just practice is super important. This is less of a thing now that they have like two weeks to prepare for the global finals. So it's like way less, uh, like that is important because there's just an infinite amount of practice time. I think it was a lot more interesting when like you had like two days of maps before you did the cups and you just kind of had to make it work as soon as you could. Uh, but I always, I always, I always think about that part of it. And, and then looking at that graph specifically, it's not surprising that the 24s were the things banned nine and 11 times. Right. And also bolstering, um, right? Between the two weekends, those two dungeons both had like fortified bolstering on them at least once. Yeah. I mean, that's just, yep. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? And then, uh, and also you didn't see, because you saw bolstering, you didn't see Waycrest as much last week. So there's not mm -hmm. like as a lot, as much info to go off of to feel like you have something in there that you're confident about. And then Rise is like this weird tech dungeon where most of these teams just don't know what kind of tech the other team has. And it's mm -hmm. like, if you can just pour it across the map after killing bosses and cleave down the battlefield trash on top of Morchi, <laughs> then like you're just you're just like what are we even doing here like you're you, what are like uh, so I, I don't know i it is weird and also seeing black or cold having being played 14 times is so tragic because that is the least fun 
dungeon to watch as a viewer. It's just so basic. Well, until that team like was flying people up on the side and somehow that didn't get disqualified, but mandatory did for doing something. Oh yeah, do we want to talk about that? Irrelevant. Yeah. 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 Stop DQing anything. Let them do whatever they want. And and that's the move. So first of all, I think that what they the strat they were gonna use is one that should be allowed, which is a warlock pet pulling through a boss wall uh that goes up. Like I personally I think that should be allowed. But they did know and, and all teams know that you have to get approval for doing that kind of stuff. And like every other team, you know, did ask for approval on other strats, including uh I think that one is what like it's a it's something where like if you think that it's good, ever since the Plague Borer incident or whatever, that we have teams actually asking admins for permission on these things and then admins either denying or approving it and then keeping it secret from the other teams and the casters and stuff and everybody. Um, it's pretty important that whenever a team doesn't go through that process and they use a strat that wouldn't have actually been allowed, that they do like... Like if they, if you if there's just no consequences for doing that, then why would any team ever send their strats in, right? And, and pretty quick, we're back to like... Uh, because I, I feel like ever since the strats have started to get sent in instead of, you know, just kind of being adjudicated day of, like it's been so much smoother and better than it used to be. So, oh, yeah. I mean, also coming from the race, the, the race is there's a couple of instances that happened many years ago where basically no one you always do. And then you ask for, 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 for right. forgiveness. You absolutely never ask for permission for something because there's been weird rulings in the past. There's been bosses killed where. X guild was told not to do certain thing. This happened to both. Raden, right? The, yeah. Uh, Raden. Um, uh, uh, what was the uh, boss in Antorus where you killed the different mechs? Oh, Kingaroth. Yeah. Kingaroth. So we were we were uh, doing Kingaroth and we were like doing it a very like cheesy way, and then they fixed it, and that was fine. But what you could do is kill the boss. You could kill the ad while the boss was casting Ruiner, and it would not gain a 25% permanent damage amp, right? Which is massive. That's the whole raid fight. Um, and we wiped pulls low because of this, because Blizzard said if you killed the boss like that, we would remove the kill. So we killed the boss Natty, and then we woke up the next day, and five European guilds all did the Ruiner thing, and Blizzard didn't do shit, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we don't ask for permission. Method on Maiden, super famous WoW kill, where... Three of Xerop's characters are in the raid. Um, you have, uh, they were told, if you see, everyone else did Maiden by having their tank solo it, and no one else did anything. But but Method at the, well, Echo now, Method at the time, they ran around in a circle and had each of their raid soak the, like, the alternate color, the light and dark thing, or the green and whatever. Uh, and, and that's because they were told that by the developers that if you keep, having tank solo this we're just going to keep buffing it to a number where that's not possible so they did it natty everyone else does it the next day they don't do anything right so both of our guilds have a history of like we're never going to ask you because that trust has been broken so we're just going to do whatever and you you do what you feel like you must right mm -hmm. and then you have Is it still like that oh yeah absolutely yeah i, I, I mean that's 100, crazy. yeah i mean it'll yeah i mean you, there's, it's just happened before but like, the thing is though is like if you ask like I mean, it's gotten better, but I don't know. I mean, there I, are like exploity ways of killing bosses that you guys wouldn't try if it became available to you, right? Like, because you'd know you're, you'd know it's not gonna, yeah, if it's there, super over the line, right? There's a line where it's ob. Well, there is lines where it's obvious, but then sometimes not. It depends on our yeah. game. Like, for example, we would have never kited the mythic ad on Sylvanas. Mm -hmm. Like we would have never that that to us would be like, okay, obviously they're just gonna fix that. We're not even gonna do it. But Echo, Echo, every every guild has like a different line. Like Echo's gonna do that and they're just gonna try to kill it before they realize what they're doing or before they wake up or something. Um but like if you were to ask permission to Blizzard to do that, they would immediately be like, do not do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But you can almost kill the boss sometimes because they're they're not gonna take your kill away if they can't stop it in time. So I don't know. It's just it's a it's a different thing, but it's it's a contentious topic but the reason i brought that up is there are players from these guilds on these teams so like sometimes you, you may have a uh a trust issue there but i don't know exactly how the mdi is run now but all, all i can tell you is from a viewer seeing mandatory's dark heart disqualified for something so completely inconsequential and then seeing some team dragon flying their their comp 
up to there and pulling the second boss in dark and black or cold with the rp pack and the trash from upstairs and cleaving it down at the same time which is insane by the way like that that's i don't think that was a really fast strat but it's a proof of concept you could definitely make something work there maybe and i think that's really cool and that's 10 times more ridiculous than what got disqualified so i just always let players do cool stuff it makes the matches more interesting uh don't disqualify anything unless it's actually ridiculous or super restrictive that's how i feel yeah i think that's, yeah uh, it's hard for me okay. to say as a competitor because like personally as a competitor i wouldn't want to play in a tournament where we spent all of his practice time just like you know doing doing whatever normal strats that have been suddenly the plague borer strat comes out from echo and there's just no winning, right? Like, it's an auto-lose. Like, yeah, you, know, you should probably have been more creative and figured out how to, like, you know, infinite misdirect and snap the playboards and et cetera, but if the other team just has, like, an auto-win condition, then it just, like, suddenly disincentivizes you from playing, and it's like, well, I mean, like, we should have tried to figure out how to do more cheesy stuff instead of, like, figure out how to play these dungeons really well. And it I definitely feels really bad when you, when you spend, like, two weeks of practice and this happens. There's definitely a line. Like, Plague Borers are the line. Like, like when you are... When the dungeon is, like, a complete meme... Like, kind of what I'm talking about is, like, pulling things with bosses or, like, doing some mm -hmm. cool tech where you do some shit. Like, auto-win conditions where it's, like, you're not even playing the dungeon. You're just doing this meme thing. Like, I, I think that is a line that I think is okay not to cross because it makes you not feel like that. But I do feel like you should try to be as creative with pulling things on bosses or getting extra trash count where you can. All that stuff is really cool. Just not when it's a full meme. Yeah, I I agree. Like there are definitely some things that aren't allowed that I think should be. Um stuff as well, like a Zolgamux through the wall back in Grimrail Depot. That that to me was like one of the biggest examples of things where it's just like everybody's doing this on live. Like if you're trying to do this key on a 25 on live, you're doing that and it's banned in uh in competition. Like those those ones yeah, I think bad. are really bad. Um, and it's any, anytime where it's something like the ones this season that you can pull stuff through the walls, often it's like I click on the mob and then I click pet attack on my warlock, right? Like I'm not doing, you know, 5G, 5D chess or whatever to figure out how to uh, manipulate the, the game to do this, right? Like I'm clicking pet attack on a mob and my, my fell hunter's walking through the wall. Um, any of those kind of things, I think those should be allowed as well. But... I respect that the rule book and what I think is going to be allowed because WoW is such a, you know, a complicated game built on such an old engine with so many weird things that are hard to fix or whatever. Like, I respect that there's going to be differences between what I think should be allowed and what is or isn't allowed. And I do think it's been really good that the teams, like, get permission for the strats they're going to use and, and get approval for them, especially because stuff like the Plague Borer, like the Plague Borer incident, originally happened because there was like basically you know bad communication about what exactly it was they wanted to do right and so uh, making sure that that communication is all is like required to be good and making sure that that actually that enforcement of that has some teeth i think is a really good thing to do so i guess i'm glad they didn't lose the series because of it but i think that you know hopefully that that means that all teams like know hey we're not getting screwed here by being the only team that's stupid enough to report our strats because we could just get away with anything if we didn't report it first right um that would be the 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 really bad lesson that could be taken from it if the if nothing happened uh to them oh we'd be furious because yeah asked exactly about that strat specifically right we and asked you got, if you... we could do that strat and they told us no right which again like i think it's i think it's bad to not allow that strat uh but I think that given that they didn't allow it, it, it would be really bad if they just let mandatory do it, right? And they're like, oh, you know, yeah. oopsie, don't do it again or something like that. Like that would be, that would create a really, uh, really perverse incentive. Uh, okay. What do we want to talk about next? We got, uh, I guess, well, I, I have another tangent. You guys want to do another MDI tangent? I have a tangent uh, about what is it? Okay. Uh, banned maps in here. Because like, shouldn't the, the fact that these bands are concentrated like you're playing against another team it's not actually pve right like you're playing against another team if it's good for me to ban throne of the tides like it is bad for you to ban throne of the tides and if it's good for me to ban wakers manor it's bad for you to ban like you want to play the maps that i don't want to play any any negative that i'm feeling towards a map is is 
a positive for you and vice versa. Right. So in some cases, there are maps I respect, like Rise in particular, where it's like, we just don't know what they're going to do in here. But there should be a team in any given series that is looking at Waycrest or Throne of the Tides and is like, oh man, this is a high bolstering key or whatever. There's a lot of volatility here. There's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. We're the underdogs in this series. We want that, right? Like we want to we want to roll the dice on something like this, right? Or like this is more bad for them than it is for us. And yet there are so many series in MDI where both teams ban the same dungeon. Um, and to me, that like that seems so weird that that okay, yeah, that so happens. We've had this scenario a lot of times. Like I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like oh, we might be worse at every map against like Echo, for example. But you know maybe we have this like volatile map that we can play. The problem is you generally have to spend a lot of time figuring out a bolstering dungeon. It is way more complicated, and it is way more, as you've said, volatile, right? Uh, compared to any of these other dungeons. And the last thing you want to do is put in a lot of time into learning one of these dungeons just for it to get banned. Because, like, you know for almost a fact that these teams, like Echo and Perplex, are gonna ban Front of the Tides and Waycrest. So if you put in all that time, it just feels completely wasted. Unless they were forced to play it. Okay, so because they're going to ban it, you shouldn't practice it. Therefore, you should ban it as well because you haven't practiced it in your other series. But also, like, you know, you just don't know what they have, right? Like, Yeah, I, I understand the basic, right? If yeah, you like, don't unless, know, yeah. you, unless you know for a fact that you have a decent Front of the Tides... It's not gonna work, cause like your your idea is that like oh like well, what what if you just don't ban it and let them ban and let them ban and you just get like a different ban right? Yeah. But worst case scenario is if you didn't practice that much for the map, and they end up not banning it and you didn't ban it, then you just have to play that map that you haven't really been practiced in, right? Yeah, I think it's a. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it just does seem weird to me because it does seem like sometimes people are just banning, like both teams are just banning the bolstering dungeon because they don't want to play it. But like you should, that it should be worse for one team than the other. I don't know. Uh, but I, yeah, I, get, sure. I get how that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it actually happened to us. Actually, Like we actually practiced bolstering Waycrest and we didn't ban Waycrest. But was that a good thing? Uh, maybe not because... We spent like what five days in Waycrest. That could have been better spent on doing anything else. Like we could have been practicing Rise. We could have been practicing a Taldas R. Yeah, and that makes sense. We only ended up playing it one time. In fact, we didn't even play Front of the Tides at all, which is the other dungeon we spent the most time on. Right? Like we spent mm -hmm. the most time on Front of the Tides and Waycrest. <laughs> we saw Waycrest once, and we saw Front of the Tides zero times. So it's like, what did we even practice for? When we could have been spending all that time practicing oh, man. Black Rock Cold or like Atal Dazar, all these other dungeons. We we did that too. We we had an absolute banger Shrine of the Storm in BFA. And it just and, got perva banned. And it was in every map pool of ours too. So we're like, there's no way this gets banned. It got banned every it got banned five times against us. I mean, that's what's gonna happen though, right? It's like even if it doesn't get banned, the first time you show it. If it is that much better than what it's everybody else is doing, it's permaban the rest of the way through, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I have I want to bring up something else about picks and bans, mainly because I've seen this take from people a lot, um, and that is you should be able to pick and ban the classes that the other team is playing. We, we had I've a um, it, it was ahead. in our Discord even in our Patreon Discord. Somebody posted a question about that that I just remembered. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to. Well, no, I actually think I read that message and I think you would be a perfect person to dispel this because I this has been asked every single thing there. It's mainly because people it would be super interesting if you weren't just watching these two teams and these two different routes, but also like two different comps and like what that looks like. And, and so that's what people want, right? They want to see that. But yeah, I would like for you to kind of break down why that wouldn't be good. It's one of those you think you want that, but you don't kind of things. Yeah, so there's a couple of different negatives that come out of a world of like spec banning or class banning one huge one is just like for competitors the practice time balloons exponentially if you add something like that because now you're not just practicing eight dungeons you're practicing okay what if we go to throne of the tides but they ban our mystery ever? like what are we gonna do then right or like okay what if we go here but this is banned right we want to ban out this other team's mage or something like that like how are we going to do this dungeon without a mage so that go you go from having eight things to practice 
to having maybe a hundred or something like that in theory, and you're going to have to triage and decide. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of transferable stuff between those, but um, that will further advantage teams that have more practice time rather than less practice time, which is uh, a downside. The other, there's a lot of other mechanisms by which it's going to advantage teams that are already advantaged that we don't want to advantage more. For instance, if you put me on my main spec, I guess I kind of a multi-classer now, but you teleport back in time like a couple of years ago when I only basically played Rogue, and you put me on Rogue up against, you know, uh, Miras on whatever DPS he was mating that season, like I'm going to lose. But it's going to be kind of close. Like I'm going to be, I'm going to be able to be doing the same number of digits of DPS, maybe, and that's pretty good, right? Like it's going to be, I might be able to to be competitive for a while, something like that. But if you take me back when I only played Rogue, and you make me play my fifth best spec, and you make Miras play his fifth best spec, like it's not going to be close, right? It's going to be a brutal, brutal slaughtering of me. I'm I'm going to be there on a class that I am much less good at, and he's good at everything. So. One problem as well then is that the teams with the multi-classers are already the best teams, right? Like Echo is the team where you could take all those players and put them on their fifth best back and they're fine with it. But then they run up against the team where it's like, hey, we're here in the MDI and we're playing Prot Warrior because our tank is a main spec Prot Warrior guy and he's playing Prot Warrior this MDI. And Echo's like, cool, we're going to ban Prot Warrior. And you're like, oh, all right. So you well, don't yeah, actually... Okay, so yeah. I don't. I don't fully agree with that, though, because I feel like if you're signing up for an MDI, it's already a given that you're gonna multi-spec because you, yeah. you honestly can't be one tricking but, to any extent in the MDI, or even like two trick or three tricking. Like you have to be flexible. And at to some extent, point like in the you, MDI. you should in order, and you'll see all the teams that qualify to the global finals do that. But if you look right. at some of the teams that didn't qualify to the global finals, we had. Resto Shaman, Fury Warrior, Prop Paladin, Holy Paladin. Yeah, but I mean, I, those specs. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's okay if we if we want to say like those teams just should not be capable yeah, division, of playing yeah, an MDI like, at all. Don't even really matter. Like not 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 to say that. Like like it, it sounds really toxic to just be oh you know these guys don't matter. But right, like, really they don't because like usually they're in the losers bracket and they're kind of just like out in the first day or second day and. Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're focused on like the top, you know, eight teams or so, and every single one of these teams are capable of multi specking to that extent. Then you get to the spot where it's like, okay, we have a really cool idea. We're gonna play an arms warrior in theater of pain or something like that, right? And like you as a team develop that strat, you practice it, you've got a cool reason why arms warrior in theater of pain is good, and you're right, and you win a theater of the pain because of it, and now. The other teams don't have to ban Theater of Pain against you. They just have to ban Arms Warrior in Theater of Pain, and now you're back yeah, on the level right. playing field, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not to mention as well, so like I've listed a couple reasons here why I think it's bad that are kind of like what impacts they'd have on which teams would win. But I also just think the games would be less good to watch. Like you want to go into an Ataldazar and do these polls that are just, we're fighting all the trash on the left onto the first boss. Like that is cool and very difficult to do and if you ban the five best specs you can't do that anymore right like you're you're not gonna you're probably not gonna be able to do that uh, especially if you know the specs that are getting banned are like a different set each time and because that pull was going to require a degree of precision that means that even if a comp can do it it has to be practiced to do it so instead you're going to see teams just playing you know worse comps and then slower and steadier and more uh more small pulls right more improvising but not the good kind of improvising like I think the kind of improvising where it's like, okay, we're just like we're just gonna play it safe, right? Because we don't want to wipe and we're probably gonna wipe if we try something MDI sized yeah. without being practiced on it. So, so I think my it other be problem good. with Yeah, I see what you were saying, but my that's also part of my problem with MDI though to be as like like a as a viewer. I feel like when it gets to the point where every team is literally doing the same thing because they've seen that show, like it's all this art, right? Like mm -hmm. we saw everyone just doing exactly what Perplex does. It just becomes extremely formulaic, and it's kind of like, all right, what's new in Talazar? Okay, well, you're going to pull all of left, and you're going to go Priestess, and then you're going to go down and snap those two Swords packs onto Razan, and they're just going to do the exact same thing every single time, right? So I don't fully agree on that part. I do feel like it does get a little bit boring when the teams are doing the exact same things, and you've, you, we've seen it multiple times. Like, the, the first time we see it in the first cup, it's really cool, right? Like, wow, Echo's doing this crazy shit, and Legendary does some other crazy shit. But then it's, it starts to all converge and people are starting to do the same shit instead of doing different things because there's just a better strategy, right? I I mean, I feel like the 
Ban thing could be interesting if they reduce practice time. Like, I don't know how you guys would feel about it, but like, what if there was really minimal amounts of practice in MDI and teams just had to figure out shit in like a day or two? I, I just think in general, when you had two days to prepare for your cup map pool versus a week, that was just better in every way. Two days was better? I completely agree, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, at least right now it's more than a week too, actually, because like you have like pre-map practice, where so you can, like, practice all the comps and stuff. I mean, in a sense, then two days was two days compared to seven days. Like two days, you had less time per map to practice, right? So if we added class bands or stuff like that, you would again oh, have less time per. Bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the two days, the two days is only like for the current world. But okay. the thing is, is, I remember some of the pushback on that is like, dude, these. People who have jobs can't just prepare on, so we need the whole week. But really what it is is the people who are really competing in this all definitely don't have jobs, and they're just able to, to practice more and more and more than you, so it doesn't actually benefit them at all. But my, my only thought, again, kind of pushing back to the, uh, uh, the class picks and bans things, is usually the people who are asking for this, they want more class diversity, and they end up finding themselves rooting for that team in the lower bracket that maybe goes in a dark heart thicket with a shaman, and a rogue because that's what those two people mean and you're like oh yeah class diversity this is what i want i hope this team can david versus goliath go against the meta and just be faster than someone right but by adding a class pick and ban system you are destroying that team's chances of ever doing anything because they're just going to increase just like dratno said they are that specific team is is so disadvantaged to anyone else, and the chances of that happening is gone forever, too. And I find that often the people suggesting the class picks and bans are also the people more likely to root for that team. So you you're, you just don't understand the result of what that would be. That So I, I completely agree with you. I, I think it would... It's It sounds fun, but it's also just really restrictive. I, I even had an idea where... And I approached Blizzard with this and I was going to put the money up for it was going to be like a like just like a 10k TGP thing in season one. And I, if I could, it was just a little bit too close to the raid. But my idea would have been that you had a if you guys have ever seen those things where it's like in basketball, it'll be like, hey, you have fifteen dollars. And these players cost $5, these players cost $4, these players cost $3, two and one. And then like craft your best starting five with under the parameters of you can only spend this much money on your team or whatever, right? It could be $15, 15 points, whatever. I did that exact same concept with WoW classes. And I like, you know, like the super bis crazy good classes were all five and the ones under that were four. And then like the ones that no one sees ever and they have a bad profile, they're like maybe one or maybe they even give you a, they give you an extra point to spend if you bring these kind negative of negative one dollar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Negative one dollar. Exactly. And I brought this to Blizzard and they were actually OK with it. And my idea for this would have been so interesting, at least from a co-streaming angle. Not only when you were seeing people go into a new dungeon for the TGP, you wouldn't be talking about like what dungeon, the narrative behind like where they're actually spending their time and where they're going first. But it's also like, oh, they chose to actually bring this class in this comp. And because this tank is randomly good at this dungeon, it allowed them to bring a mage where you normally wouldn't have the points for that. And it would have like endless kind of possibilities. I, I assumed Blizzard was going to kind of push back on this because it involved putting a power level value to classes and it kind of showed the level of imbalance that existed at the time. Um, but they were actually totally fine with it. They didn't care at all. They had a little pushback against some classes actually giving you points back, like negative $1. Uh, and then I told them that, well, and, and I made a bunch of these mock examples and not a single person picked any of these specs when they were only $1. So by making them give you a point back, it actually made them like a, it's, it made it an interesting choice in a class mm. you would consider. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think something like that could be cool. Uh, if, if they could ever, I don't think you'll ever do that officially, but like, I just think it would be at least for like a community tournament. I think it'd be so fun to watch if you can get the best teams in there. Yeah, believe it or not, I pitched basically that to Golden Guardians as well to try and get them back when that org existed to try and get us to run something. I don't know if it was going to be TGP style or something like that, but the dollar buy thing, because I think it was also being talked about on Twitter, like you or JB or something were tweeting something about it. Maybe it was just JB, but I remember being like, this is a really good idea. We should, we should, you know, do this. We should make a tournament with this, but that didn't go anywhere either. I don't know. It'd be a cool thing. We could, we should, uh, 
we could do it we could we could yeah. do it if Remember the those. only thing is it's really hard to do an extra mdi or tg like i wanted to do it in season one because there wasn't a tgp and i just think mm. the tgp is just better than the mdi so this season you could even do the same thing and they would probably approve it because they did before um but it would only be interesting if you have the best teams and if you don't have the best teams then you have nothing even if you have this format so uh i i that's the hardest thing have it enough money to get those teams to care mm -hmm. to do it yeah i think the biggest takeaway is like really seeing the top teams being creative because i feel like it just gets boring when the top teams are all doing the same thing and it just boils down to like execution i know that's like uh, something that a lot of people enjoy but when i watched mdi i, I like to see creativity 100 mm percent. -hmm. yeah I, I think that it's not impossible but it could be really cool but We've got Dorky needing to get back to uh, to MDI prison very soon, so... Oh, don't put uh, me back in there. Uh, they're, they're coming, but first we get to do a, a, a Patreon question from Caseman. It says, there's long been lapses between raids, in, or there's been long lapses between raids in the past, but rarely do you know so far in advance how long the time between raids will be. How does this affect your plans between now and 11.0? And so Dorky isn't left out. What do you do if next season sucks and you know it's going to suck until, like, September? Basically, like, if a season starts oh. and uh, beguiling is the affix or whatever. Yeah, dude, that's actually so interesting. I, I, I've never thought about it from, like, the dorky perspective of, like, he isn't fucking, like, this is just a Mythic Plus season. But, like, we want them to try so hard and, like, really, like, cook, you know, with Mythic Plus in season four for the future. But, like, that also involves the absolute risk of that being terrible, right? Like, you mentioned beguiling. You bring back, let's say like, oh, we're bringing seasonals back. Everyone's like, yay. But then the seasonal blows like some of them have. Then like, then you're sitting here like, dude, I have nothing to do. And he's so right. The, usually you're like, when you're in the last tier of an expansion, you have like a general idea in your head of how long farm is, but you don't have like a roadmap of when the next expansion is coming out. It's like this kind of indefinite period of, of long farm times. But yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, like, I just, I feel, I want to, I want to raid. Like, I want to do progression raiding again already. And knowing that it's so far in the future is, uh, that's, that's rough. Like, I, but I mean, the old way of doing it would be just like, I wouldn't know how far in the future it was, but I'd still know it was probably a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to move to a world where there's never this long between raids. That, that would be sweet. Um, how does it affect my plans? I don't know. I mean, I have more, I will have more to do during this content drought than during last one. Cause there's going to be alpha soon. Uh, and as soon as that's out, like I got, I'll have stuff to do. Um, whereas last time it was, it was kind of like actually nothing for the few months before Mirror Distill. So, uh, at least that should be interesting, but it doesn't scratch the itch in the way that like a new season on live actually does. So Dorky, yeah, how about you? Me, what, it's, yeah. It's quite different because. I, I kind of, like, do it all, right? Like, uh, the beginning of the season is great because, you know, it's the beginning of the season hype. Everyone's playing. We're all gearing up. I'm doing progression raid as well. And then we get to, like, the mid and late season, right? Which is where a lot of you guys struggle with. But for me, like, it's still great because middle season is, like, if I'm competing MDR TGP, I'm doing that, which is, like, right now. Or, like, late season would be when the major pushing happens, right? Like, that's when high M plus pushing really starts that's when people are busting out all the biggest keys and the biggest strats so in terms of like plans like there's still a lot going on for me there but i do see it like if it really sucks like if, if there's like really nothing going on and like that's kind of this season this season m plus hasn't really been popping off late season there's not as much going on right now. There's not a lot of teams going for the highest keys. And really, there hasn't been a whole lot of push weeks. We've just been getting weeks like bolstering week. And last week, whatever the hell it was, raging, tyrannical. Yeah. But yeah, I like it. I kind of wish there was a little bit more in between. Yeah. I Long farm periods for me... And a lot of WoW players aren't like this. There's a lot of WoW players that are like WoW players. You know, like they play WoW the whole time. I, it's just, this is true in every season, but even in the last season, I'd find myself doing the most amount of playing other games or doing other things. And that doesn't bother me at all. 
I, I really enjoy it and look forward to it. And the way that I deal with a super, super long farm period is I don't play this game at all. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah, dude, for me, actually, how bad it is depends on if I have another game that I'm excited to wake up and play. Because, like, sometimes I have one of those, and then I'm kind of fine with WoW not having stuff going on. But then sometimes I don't, and, man, I'm just waking up and like, ah, I wish there was a raid, right? I wish there was something to do. Oh, yeah, and, and also my stream content is so focused on the changes that are happening to WoW. I find mm -hmm. that fascinating, and therefore I talk about it a lot on my stream. And the, the long, super long farm period in the expansion also means that's when alpha and beta is happening. And that's usually when I am the most locked in and like really care and stream the Ooh. most. That That's when my channel does the best in a two year cycle is not a, well, a race, a race world first month. There's nothing that's going to touch that. But like, like outside of the race, I, I think I averaged 7k viewers in the four months leading up to Dragonflight coming out just natty right and that's only because i just love alpha and beta and a lot of people come to my channel for something like that um ptr too that's a big part in between yeah. patches yeah ptr is sick and uh, yeah so like just not even tying his question to like end of expansion ship like what do you do out inside of seasons it's like ptr for us is big yeah and then so for me i because i don't have to log in and do like mythic plus or raid or something I just am talking about the new expansion and playing other games. It's like a perfect medium, and, and I don't feel like it's a long period because I look forward to that time a lot. All right. On that note, we will be uh, we'll be heading out here. Good luck in your practice, Dorky. We'll see everybody, except for you, maybe, Dorky, next week. We'll I don't know. We'll figure out what we're going to do. Yep. Stay tuned. Yeah. We have plenty of replacement Thank cats you. if needed. That's true. We can, we can draft another that. cat in here. Growl's been yeah, working on his impression. One of those idiots, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right cool see you guys next week that's the end of this episode